Good evening and welcome to Grace Conference's March 2022 online meeting. Come to you from all over North America. Well, I'm in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, but we have speakers coming to you from exotic places like Tennessee, British Columbia, and Wisconsin, just to name a few. All the speakers will be talking all things gospel. The gospel is the good news, and our intention is to proclaim it this weekend. It's not just good news for a few chosen, but it's good news for the entire planet. Regardless of your belief system, the gospel breaks down religious barriers. Why? Because it is unconditionally for everybody. It exalts every human being, even if you don't believe it. Did you get that? Even if you don't believe it, that's because what Christ did, he did for all, once and for all. The gospel always unites. When I started my journey with Christ back in the 70s, I quickly got caught up in the exclusivity of Christianity. Then after about 20 years of exposure to Christianity, I sat down in some meetings where Mike was preaching and he taught and my life was set free of religious bondage. Until you know that what Christ did for you, he did for the whole world, bar none, you're in bondage. It's so good to be free of that. Freedom is a beautiful word. The gospel sets you free. All the messages that you will hear over the next few days right through to 7 p.m. Sunday evening when we invite you to join us for a Zoom meeting and you can ask questions of all the main speakers have to do with the subject called the gospel. I'm hoping that we will be able to soon go back to meeting in person here in Calgary, but it is what it is and we definitely save on travel costs. The speakers that will be bringing their thoughts and insights over the next few days headed up by Mike, Mike Williams and Daniel, but including a group of other great speakers as well, to name a few, Nardless, Kabidi, Jeannie Hope, and Jackie Barnard. They're all here, and they're going to be over Saturday and, and Sunday, they're going to be talking to you about the gospel. So grab some popcorn, fasten your seat belts, kick back, and enjoy. To start off, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Michael Lilborn Williams. Michael is so very passionate about what he does. What I personally appreciate about his teaching style is his emphasis on context, logic, and reason. He's a skillful surgeon dissecting in, dissecting in context the book we love, the scriptures. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Michael. Hello, gospel revolutionaries around the world. Daniel Rouse and Michael Lilborn Williams. It is me and Daniel both on camera tonight, and we're going to be with you throughout this entire session. And uh, it's going to be a really big one. So I needed somebody to help me out. Couldn't do this by myself. Tonight, so. <laughs> Just the two of us. Uh, yeah, we, we should have come up with a jingle or I something. we can so. make it if we try. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord, this is going to go downhill from here, I can already tell. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome to the 2022 mm -hmm. Virtual winter, mm -hmm. winter, winter Calgary Grace Conference. And we're not in Calgary, but we are here from the Secret City and in your living rooms. So thank you for welcoming us. Mm -hmm. We got an exciting weekend for you. Uh, we got tonight's session. Saturday, we got a bunch of sessions going on. Sunday, we have a bunch of sessions going on. So look below the video and you'll see the whole calendar coming up. Uh, we got Nardos Kabidi is going to be speaking. Jackie Barnard, Jeannie Hope. Uh, some guy named Daniel Rouse is going to be on there as well. And you'll see Michael a time or two more. <laughs> so we're so excited to have you with us. And uh, as always, thanks to our Calgary crew who are our hosts. Thank you for hosting us, even though it's virtually again this year. Uh, you are the gracious host and we are appreciated to be here. Yes. Say bunch of sessions for me one Bunt more time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're going to have a bunch of sessions for you. <laughs> I can't pass up an opportunity to make fun of Daniel. I just can't do it. Uh, he's younger and prettier than me, so we have to keep him in his place. In my place, I shall remain. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, would you prepare yourselves? Because that great heretic, that great unteacher, our president of the Gospel Revolution, Michael, has a wonderful word. So, Michael? Thanks, Daniel. And uh, as... You see, Daniel and I are going to be here. Daniel, you're blending in with the drapes. You need to do <laughs> I plan that. I, did, I don't know whether you did or not. Uh, but uh, yes, the, uh, the title of our conference 
is uh, who and what I am not. So as we've shared with you now, if you just got off of the uh, the teaching on Romans chapter 8, and you're coming into this, boy, you're prepared for what we're about to say. Uh, this teaching uh, has also never been taught on planet Earth. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how it keeps happening, but what we're going to be sharing with you tonight, it is, as always, it's either true or it's not true. Mm. Now, all we're going to do I'm laying part of the blame on Daniel. Uh, what we're going to do, though, is we're going to present this to you, and you're going to have to listen and see what you think about what we're teaching because this is off the chain. Mm. It really is. And uh, it's been uh, something that's been brewing in me just for the last few days. I had never entertained the thought of the difference in the subject matter that we are going to go into. Now, remember, this is either true or it's not true. It's just that simple. <laughs> there either is a difference in what we're going to be presenting to you or there's not a difference. Uh, I have, of course, uh, put myself on the line, and this being the first uh, conference, uh, the first session of the conference of the, uh, for Calgary for this year, uh, I've put myself on the line that I know what I'm talking about. So uh, uh, by being here, I think I'm right. <laughs> uh, so uh, let me tell you what happened in the lead up to this. After we got through with the book of Romans, and uh, or we did chapter 8, I don't remember at what point it was, but suddenly there was an issue that came into my mind about imputed righteousness. And uh, I couldn't get rid of it. I even called a couple of people to find out about what their immediate reaction was. Uh, uh, had people that um, uh, reacted immediately to the positive and also to the negative. Uh, but I still want a chance to explain this uh, and see what you guys think. Uh, is there a difference between imputed righteousness and the righteousness that we have in Christ? Now, uh, Abraham's righteousness was imputed. Now, you know that the term imputed means to charge to someone's account or credit to someone's account. We know the teachings and we've compared them to uh, Adam's transgression we've, uh, and, and how that this was imputed. And uh, that, uh, and and we have accepted the fact that we have imputed righteousness. But as I started looking into it, I began to realize there was a so, uh, there was a difference, and it was found in the book of Romans that there is a difference between being made righteous and having imputed righteousness. Now, is that difference taught by Paul? Now we're either just coming up with this, and I'm blaming it all on Daniel, as you readily see. I'm already <laughs> passing the buck off to him. But this is either taught by Paul in his letters, or it's not taught by Paul. We don't ever bring you something to where that we have to try to uh, hodgepodge something together. Now, we're going to be focusing, of course, on this term imputed, and we're going to be focusing on the viability of did Paul teach a difference between imputed righteousness and being made righteous? And if there is a difference, what does it make a difference? I mean, I mean, are, are we splitting hairs? As uh, one of my friends told me they thought we were doing, or thought I was doing, I can't get Daniel in on all of it because he wasn't in on the first part of this. Uh, uh, when I was kind of checking around and seeing what some other people had to think about it. So uh, when Paul does quote about Abraham and him receiving imputed righteousness, it comes out of Genesis. So if we're going to start somewhere, we're going to start in Genesis, and then we're going to show you the term imputed also that it is used in the Old Testament. Now, it's used in the Old Testament 
uh, just uh, about three times, three or four times, I think. But the term imputed in the Hebrew is used a lot more than that. And we're going to show you uh, how this word breaks down. It's important to understand what imputed means and what it does not mean. So if there is a difference, then we have to make sure we understand what imputed means. And so far, you understand imputed in one aspect of it, but it has a broader understanding to it, especially out of the, uh, the text where the teaching came from, which was out of Genesis. And yes, we've checked the Septuagint. And yes, this all translates directly to the New Testament. It is the same word. And the way that this breaks down uh, in the Old Testament is really beautiful. So we're wanting to lay the foundation of this understanding about imputed righteousness. Because uh, remember, uh, uh, there was none righteous, no, not one. And Isaiah said that long after Abraham. So what is this? What did he mean that there was none righteous, no, not one? Uh, righteousness was imputed to Abraham. But you see, Isaiah was prophesying about a righteousness that Abraham didn't get. Uh, he got imputed righteousness. He got a credit for righteousness. And we're going to show you how that Paul, if it's in there, it's going to show how that that is the doctrine that Christianity is built on. It's built on imputed righteousness, which we're going to go through this in a great deal of detail. But uh, this imputed righteousness is based on man's faith. The righteousness of God is not based on man's faith. You know all of those places where you've read to them that believe, to them that believe? Bingo. We've got it for you. And, and suddenly this all cleared up, and we realized that not only did Paul teach on this type of righteousness that was imputed righteousness and then, then uh, taught us on another whole type of righteousness, uh, but also James taught on it. And you're going to see that James agrees that imputed righteousness includes a faith that has to have works. In fact, the faith itself is works. Do you know that even if man has to believe, that's a work? Now, so what we have, though, is not by works at all. So let me start with the story and get on with this, all right? You guys just keep holding me back here. What are you doing? <laughs> uh, all right. So uh, here is where this is recorded in Genesis chapter 15. And we're going to read from uh, uh, chapter 15, verse 1 through 16. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I, have thy, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the one of, and behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying. Now it says that the word of the Lord came unto him, saying. Uh, uh, I know we're, we try not to beat a dead horse, but we know there's people who just don't believe that this is the word of the Lord that came to Abraham, or he was still Abram actually at this point. And behold, the the word of the Lord came unto him, saying. This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come before out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, 
if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. Now, I want you to remember how that Paul taught, we're going to take you into it, but we need to stop and put some markers in this. Remember who the seed is? And the seed that was that produced all of these stars was not what came out of Abraham's loins, Paul taught in detail. It was out of the seed that uh, God sent in Abraham, and that was the seed. And, and he described that very clearly, I think, in Galatians, that that seed was Christ himself. And it says that Abraham, that Abraham believed in the Lord and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now, that's where this whole story begins. It's where the whole doctrine begins about imputed righteousness. So God did impute righteousness to him, but it was because he believed. Now, where we've tried to make this go, but it just doesn't fit, is that we say this is a type and shadow of the faith of God. Now, that worked until we started looking at it a little bit closer. And he believed in the Lord, and it was counted to him. It does, let, me, let me tell you what it does not say. It does not say that when he believed in the Lord that God made him righteous. He had a credit card. He had a credit. He had a, uh, well, in fact, let's go uh, down through uh, this word where it says that he was credited with righteousness. And uh, uh, let's, let's look at those just a minute here. Uh, there are several ways that that is uh, translated. Uh, it's all the same uh, Hebrew word. And uh, Daniel, uh, we're going to go down through uh, the uh, list here. And so we find out that the word uh, for uh, being counted for righteousness or imputed, the word counted is the very same word as imputed. Is that, that's correct, yep, isn't it, Daniel? Correct. All right. So it's the very same word uh, in the Hebrew uh, for the word imputed. Now, we've got two places here we're going to show you what the word imputed, how it is used in Leviticus. Before we do that, though, I want to clarify what imputed means. So uh, there's quite a few places. How many does it say there altogether that this word uh, imputed shows up? Do you have a count there, the total amount? Uh, we don't need it probably 20, 30, 40, 50, uh, maybe 60 times or so, yeah, something that. like that. Yeah. There's around 60 times that this word shows up. But uh, the here are the ways that it gets translated other than the word imputed. We're going to show you where it's translated imputed. Here it's translated as the word counted, but it does mean imputed here. But here is how it is translated in other places in the Old Testament. It is the word devised. So this is a devised righteousness. Mm. Now, when you look at the Thayers to understand the word devised, the terms improvised and blueprint come up. So this righteousness is an improvised righteousness. What is something that's what is something that's improvised? It means that it's there till the real thing comes along. Mm. Let's improvise until. Mm. So it is uh, 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 that is the word devised. Now that's used over 22 times that that word is used in that way is the, the word imagine. Uh, and you'll see that this, these are things that if you translate this into Christianity, you get Christianity 101. Uh, they're dealing with, uh, they're improvising every day of their lives they're, uh, by their own faith. They're devising something. That's the reason that you got to go every <laughs> uh, three times a week is because you, you've got to devise this and, com uh, and constantly be fixing it, if you will. Uh, cunning, it's devised, 
It is translated as the word cunning, uh, to word reckon, uh, uh, to purpose, to, to esteem. So that's what you give to somebody when they deserve a reward or get a reward for something. Now, remember, Abraham was rewarded with righteousness because of his faith, and it was imputed to him. But it was imputed to him as a reward for his faith. Let me again, let me tell you what it does not say. It does not say that God made Abraham righteous. It says that God imputed righteousness to him. So even where you read in the New Testament about the righteousness of Abraham, you have to remember that it is imputed righteousness that uh, not only that it is recorded here, but also in the New Testament. Now, I want to show you a couple of places in Leviticus. It's like, oh my gosh, is it going to get that boring? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in Leviticus chapter 7, verse 18, I just want to show you where the, and this is the word impute here, and it describes really this process, this uh, giving a credit for something. Uh, this doesn't describe something internal whatsoever. This describes something external. This describes something uh, that describes a temporal result for a temporal covenant. Mm. Now, we don't have a temporal covenant anymore. Do you see that this Abrahamic covenant, uh, when it went into place, that this has been translated now into the faith of God, which is different than the faith of Abraham. Now, like I said, if Paul teaches there's a difference between these two, it'll be in his teachings. We're not going to have to try to contrive it whatsoever. Here in Leviticus chapter 7, verse 18, And if any of the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offering be eaten at all on the third day, it shall not be accepted, neither shall it be imputed unto him that offereth it. It shall be an abomination, and the soul that eateth it shall bear his iniquity. So he's saying that if you don't handle the sacrifice correctly, you don't get what was to be imputed, the credit for doing that sacrifice. So uh, here is the word imputed, the very same word that God told Abraham that he would impute this to him. So we find the word imputed wrapped up in a, in a covenant that we're not a part of. We're not a part of this covenant uh, whatsoever. Now, I'm glad that we are able to rely on researching in this covenant, but thank God, is it possible that the righteousness that you have isn't a credit. It's not imputed because it's not your faith. Is it possible that Paul delineated between the faith of God and his righteousness and our faith and it being imputed if we do believe? If you do believe, It'll be imputed, just like it was Abraham. Is that what Paul teaches? We shall see. Leviticus chapter 17, verse, we're going to just read 1 through 5. And the Lord spake unto Moses. Let me stop again and bore you once more. The Lord spake unto Moses. Uh, for those of you that have a hard time that God was doing the talk and not Moses dreaming this up in his head. And the Lord spake unto Moses, speak unto Aaron and unto his sons and to all the children of Israel and say unto them, this is the thing which the Lord hath commanded saying, what man soever there be of the house of Israel that killeth an ox or a lamb or a goat in the camp or that killeth it out of the camp and bringeth it not into the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to offer an offering unto the Lord before the tabernacle of the Lord, 
blood shall be imputed unto that man. He hath shed blood, and that man shall be cut off from among his people. And we're just reading through verse 4. So here's the word imputed. Now, where the, the word, the actual word imputed shows up, this is the only two times in the Old Testament that that word shows up. Now, the I've already explained to you how that the Hebrew word for that, which is the word counted, which was used pertaining to Abraham. And you know, by the time we get to the New Testament, that Paul says uses the word imputed. The Old Testament, they happen to translate that word as counted, but it would have been proper for them and for continuity, I would think, that it would have been a wise thing for them to use the word imputed in the story here and also in the story in the New Testament. But for some reason, they chose counted uh, instead of imputed, even though it means imputed. All right. So uh, this righteousness that we have, is it different than Abraham's imputed righteousness? That's what we're going to find out. And is that an important distinction? You see, uh, there's, there's some things that, you know, when you look at them, you might see a distinction, but the difference is so unimportant that it's just not hardly worth talking about. Uh, I'm not presenting this to you tonight because I think that it is minorly important. I think it's majorly important. I think it's vitally important because if this indeed, if Paul taught on this and helped us understand the difference between imputed righteousness and being made righteous, then we may have the key to why Paul said that, that uh, righteousness would be imputed to them that believe. Was that a doctrine Paul was espousing in Romans? Or is it a doctrine that Paul was trying his best to help people not fall into? Uh, like I said, later on at the end of this teaching, I want to take you and show you that one of Paul's counterparts, James, did teach on this imputed righteousness, and he made it very clear what he and I think the disciples thought about imputed righteousness. I think imputed righteousness is where Christianity is born. Because it says it clearly that it's imputed to them that believe, just like Abraham. So, uh, I think that we're ready to move on. <laughs> we need to go to Romans chapter 3. Big jump. At least we got out of Leviticus. <laughs> Before we had any more sacrifices and anybody cutting something up, right? All right, so uh, Romans chapter 3, and we're going to read in verse 20 through 25. Now track with us very closely here. This is where Paul begins to help us see the difference in this. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Now, what God brought, the righteousness that God brought to us through Christ had to be different than what the righteousness was imputed to Abraham because the law and the prophets had not seen this before. This is something the law and the prophets had not seen, not something they had seen. They knew there was a difference between the righteousness that was imputed to Abraham and the righteousness that we were made to be 
because of somebody else's faith, not ours, including Abraham's. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. Now listen to this. By the faith of Jesus Christ unto and up on unto all and up on all them that believe, for there is no difference. Now, this righteousness came to who? All and up on all them that believe, for there is no difference. <laughs> Don Bartlett nailed me to the wall with this and had to rub my nose in it to get me to see it. And uh, but it's here, and that that the righteousness that comes from Christ came to all. And then he says it also comes to those that believe. Why? Because there is no difference between all and those uh, that believe. Why? For all have sinned and come short of the glory. Why did it come upon all instead of just believers? Because all have sinned. That's what this whole book is about. Mm. Am I doing okay, Dan? Oh, yeah, this is good. <laughs> I don't have much room to dance. <laughs> <laughs> For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, not all have believed, but this righteousness has come upon all. And it even came upon all those that believe, because there is no difference. In whose eyes, with this righteousness, is there no difference between a believer and an unbeliever? In God's eyes because it's his righteousness. And this came upon all. And it also came upon all that believe. For there is no difference. I'm just it's like I got to keep saying it over and over just it's it's like this too magnificent. I mean I, this has been read over by me number 1 uh for uh most of the decades of my life until Don Bartlett forced me to look at it. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justifri- justified, <laughs> if I'm going to make fun of Daniel, i got to point out my own mistakes, <laughs> being justified by, <laughs> by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So, you see, we're justified freely. All have been justified freely through the redemption that is in Christ, even those that believe. <laughs> whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness. Now, just in case you missed it, look what Paul says in verse 25. Whom God hath set forth. So who's doing this? God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood whose faith is in the blood of Christ. It's God's faith that's in the blood of Christ that brought redemption, Mm. that brought this righteousness. Here's where Paul has delineated this, and I'm telling you, we're going to show you right straight down through Paul's teachings, and then like I said, at the end, we're going to go back and show you where James agrees that imputed righteousness is a work. Imputed righteousness is what Abraham had, but it was to Abraham and his seed. Now, the seed, though, was not done by the faith of anybody. It was done by the faith of God. And this, this, this righteousness that we have, we're going to see. Now, we're still going to check and see, though. Is there a difference other than what we've found here? Now, what we have found out is that this righteousness came upon all, even those that believe. I, just, I think it's just hilarious. It came upon all, even those that believe. 
But because why did it come upon all, even the believers? Because there's no difference between a believer and an unbeliever in whose eyes? In the one who had faith in the blood of Christ. Mm. Which faith do you want to live by? Yours or his? Which righteousness do you want? Because imputed righteousness comes by people's faith. God's faith does not impute. God's faith makes. This isn't something God took from one and gave to the other. This is something that God created brand new, a new world. A, a whole new creation, a righteous creation that never existed before. All right. Are you ready to move on? I don't know. Are you sitting on a stable chair? <laughs> <laughs> I had to make sure my, st- my chair was okay. All right. We're going to go to Romans chapter 4. That's what the conference is all about, right? So, Uh, What I'm teaching you tonight is what we are not, who and what I am not. Let me go ahead and tell you what mine is tonight. I am not imputed with righteousness. (laughs) I may be the first person that's ever said that. I am not imputed with righteousness. I was made righteous. It didn't have to be imputed. It's not cre- it's not a credit that I have. Now, so here in Romans, where are we going? Romans chapter 4. Uh let's read a bit uh more about Abraham and just uh see how this goes. In Romans chapter Uh, 4, verse 11 through 16, and is speaking about Abraham. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had, yet being uncircumcised. Now, who had this faith? It was Abraham. And he, when did he have this faith? Before he was ever circumcised. That he might be the father of all them that believe. This is why Christianity is built on this doctrine of you've got to believe. It's in here. But it's in the same book where Paul challenges this doctrine. We just went through uh, uh, several weeks of shows that I, I hope you got that, that Paul is challenging this faith. And when you get over to uh, Romans chapter 10, he just says, You know, all this call upon the name of the Lord, all of this, the word faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. I'm I'm sorry, it didn't happen by your faith. Uh, and, And he begins to challenge and begins to help deconstruct. And let me tell you what. This deconstruction was not successful with Christianity. It was not successful. Do you want it to be successful with you? Let Paul, not Mike Williams or Daniel Rouse, either one, let Paul deconstruct this for you so that when you go to bed tonight, you not only, if you watched the, uh, our, our listened to our last show, which I hope you did, Uh, You're not only going to be looking in the mirror and saying, my gosh, I am immortal Uh, because sin and law doesn't apply to me. That's what Romans, that's out of the book of Romans 2, Romans chapter 8. It's how radical this understanding is, is that it's, uh, there's things taught by Paul here that we just didn't catch because we'd been taught another way first. And we're still trying to unravel all of this. And uh, it says that uh, 
that he might be the father of all them that believe. So what have we sung all of our lives? Father Abraham, as many sons, sons, right? So, but it was to Abraham and his seed, which is Christ. Though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them. So he did it by his faith, right? Mm -hmm. So if you get imputed righteousness, what do you have to do? Bully. (laughs) (laughs) I need my little hand puppet over here. Believe. There you go. Uh, Now, and see, this is the one thing that we've not been able to reconcile in all of this teaching that we've done in all of these years is that it clearly says that uh, imputed righteousness goes to the believer. Imputed righteousness, you don't know how excited you ought to be right now. (laughs) Imputed righteousness goes to the believer. And the father of circumcision uh, to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who was also, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham. (laughs) In the steps of Abraham's faith, which he had being yet uncircumcised. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For for if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise is made of no effect. But the law worketh wrath, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it might be of grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to that which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Now, is Paul challenging this? We've already read read what he said already in, what was it, Romans 3? Uh, Where he is made clearly that it was God's faith in the blood of Christ that brought this redemption and brought righteousness. So you'll never win this argument with a Christian unless you understand the difference between imputed righteousness and being made righteous, because they are right. The New Testament's full of it, but you see, we've been right too. Why were both of us right? Because we didn't know Paul was clearly delineating between the faith that it takes to have imputed righteousness and the faith of God that makes all righteous. Because you are not the children of Abraham. You're the children of God. He's the one whose faith has acquired this and created us in his own righteous likeness. The very image of Christ. We're no longer in the image of God. We are the image of Christ. Drastic difference. All right, so uh, let's go to Romans chapter 4. And we're just going to simply drop down to the last part of this story in verse 21 through 25. And being fully persuaded that when, that what he had promised, he was able to perform. Is that the righteousness that you have? That you're convinced that what God promised he would do? That's what the whole Christian world's bound to, folks. And it has produced 45,000 denominations and counting. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake only that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised Jesus up from the dead 
who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Now, uh, it's very clear here that to have imputed righteousness, I can't take that out of the Bible for you folks. So you say, well, how did we get where we are? Because we emphasized Paul's other teaching on this. Paul's other teaching on this, we'll take you through that too, but you've got to see that Paul was giving an appeal to the church to leave behind this righteousness that comes by a demand for personal faith. Because you see, that failed. That failed. Remember what John said? That none of them believed. Nobody believed. You see, nobody followed in the foot uh, the footsteps of faithful Abraham. Nobody was ever able to believe like that. That's why that God took over the issue of faith and not imputing or giving us a credit for righteousness or giving us something that would last until the real thing got here. You see, that's what that's what the word meant. That's what the word impute means. Uh, that's, that's what it literally means. It means here, take this until the real thing gets there. <laughs> real thing's here. Got here 2,000 years ago. But you, you see, you'll never get away from the fact that Paul teaches very clearly that imputed righteousness comes to those that believe. Now, we've worked around this, we've worked about it, above it, beyond it, and everything else, and we've never let go of Paul's teaching about this righteousness, and we've, we've said it was imputed righteousness, but here is the problem. Imputed righteousness will require that you believe. You say, well, what's wrong with imputed righteousness? It requires just like what did out of Father Abraham, it requires your belief. But then God, in his faith in the blood of Christ, gave us, created us all in this new redemption, has brought righteousness and made us all righteousness to those that, to all, even those that believe. It covers all, including those that believe, because there is no difference now. You see, until Christ, the faith of Abraham was the only example that the people had to go by. But the faith of Abraham has become obsolete. Why? Because the thing that we waited for for so long is now here. It's not something we're hoping for. It's not something that if I believe enough, I've got it. Paul's made this statement too many times that imputed righteousness requires belief. And then there's those other teachings that we've been sharing with you. All right, so we're going to move on. Can I ask a question? You can. So I was just thinking about it as you're talking about it, that this righteousness comes to an end. Um, one of the things that I recall is when Jesus talked about enduring to the end. Oh, yes. Do you think that was in regards to his faith and this righteousness? Well, I mean, it, isn't that what Jesus was requiring out of them was to believe? Yeah. And then he said in the context, I think if we go back and read that in context, it is Jesus is talking to people who he has required to believe, just like Abraham did. Mm -hmm. Right? And what does he say? Even Jesus said, if you do believe, you'll have to endure to the end mm. to be saved. So why is it that belief, even Jesus acknowledged that if you do believe in me, it's not just a one bop, bop, bit of being, say a prayer, you got it, like Christianity teaches. And there are some radical churches that actually teach you got to stay right with God till the end. Mm. We didn't like those churches. <laughs> 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 that 
it's just too hard. <laughs> we can get it one time in a good service. You get me worked up, get me crying about Jesus dying on the cross. And then get me to pray real quick, real quick, real quick, because I'm believing right now, right now. Boom, it's done. Oh, thank God that's done. No, Jesus said, if you're going to believe, good question, Danny. If you're going to believe, it better last till the end, or you won't be saved. Hmm. Hope you come up with some more questions. <laughs> All right. So we're going to take you to uh, 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 5. Where is 2 Corinthians chapter 5? I think it's back this way, isn't it? After 1 Corinthians. Yeah. <laughs> Smarty. 2 Corinthians. <laughs> uh, uh, da 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 Okay, so 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I thought I had it marked, but I didn't. Uh, chapter 5, and we're looking at verses 19, 20, and 21. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Wow. He didn't say that he's committed unto us the word of imputation. Mm. <laughs> now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. Mm. You see, for this to be equal nuts to nuts, as they say, Jesus did not get sin imputed to him. Mm. He became sin. The only way that this could work out is the very same way that Jesus became sin. It's through the same process that we became righteous. Now look what he had to do first though, Daniel. He had to cancel out imputed sin first. Yeah. Guess what else he evidently canceled out? Imputed righteousness. Mm. Mm. It says that we were made righteous. Now, Paul was using the term imputed here. He could have used it again. But instead, he's, uh, uh, he made it very clear. He says, not imputing their trespasses and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So uh, why didn't he tell us that we have the word of imputation? Hmm. Shouldn't we be teaching imputation instead of reconciliation? But this is not imputation, folks. This isn't the down payment. This isn't the thing before the real thing. This is it. Not only is this it, you're it. Mm. You are it. You are the righteousness of God in Christ, not an imputed righteousness, because that righteousness you have to believe for, and that righteousness you have to endure to the end mm. to be able to hang on to it. You see, Christianity is in the Bible. You see, people have wondered how in the world, if, if what we're teaching is true, why is this stuff in the Bible? How, how do people get this out of the Bible? Because they don't slow down and teach on Romans 40 times in a row. <laughs> There's another one coming. <laughs> yes, we almost had another one before we realized we'd had to do another one. If we'd done another one, then we'd had to do another one anyway. So we skipped another one. <laughs> All right, now we're going to go to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. 
And we are going to uh, dun, 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 chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. How did I get all the way back to Romans 5? <laughs> I could have swore I marked these pages. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. See, a lot of these are very familiar verses to you, but what we're doing now is putting them in a comparative context or uh, uh, extending them in the comparative context that Paul put them in. I didn't come up with this comparative teaching. This is Paul's comparative teaching between imputed righteousness by the faith of Abraham and all of those that believe after him. This is Paul's teaching about the difference between that imputed righteousness and the righteousness of, that we've been given. Folks, I'm just, I'm almost overcome with just absolute amazement mm. at what Jesus has done for us, for the whole human race. So uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30. But of him are you in Christ Jesus, who has made there's the word made again, made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Mm. You don't have imputed wisdom. You don't have imputed sanctification. You don't have imputed redemption. Why? Because none of them are by your faith. You don't have imputed righteousness because it's not by your faith. I, uh, verse 31, can't leave that one in out because Paul always went to some degree of euphoria whenever he, <laughs> uh, whenever he got one of these things out that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. If you gotta, if you gotta say anything about righteousness, just glory in the Lord, because this is not the same righteousness this is not your father Abraham's righteousness. <laughs> you remember that commercial, this isn't your father's Oldsmobile? <laughs> <laughs> Folks, this is not your father Abraham's Oldsmobile. <laughs> this, the, what you have been given is not your father's Abraham's righteousness. Mm. What you've been given, and that righteousness was, uh, was imputed, what you've been given is your father God's righteousness wow. by his faith. It was right, God's righteousness that was imputed to Abraham, but it was by Abraham's faith. But you see, this is not by our faith. Did you see how many times did we have to read it? That if you're going to get imputed righteousness, you've got to believe, you've got to believe, you've got to believe, you've got to believe. Mm. And if you don't get that straightened out, you're going to read John chapter 1 or all of John again and see how many times Jesus required you to believe. But you're going to have to accept that you're going to have to believe perfectly all the way to the end or you won't be saved. Mm. Oh, my goodness. So where in the world can we go from here? <laughs> Uh, Hebrews, oh, you can't leave Hebrews out of a teaching like this because uh, Paul and Apollos did shadow each other. Uh, no, Paul did not write Hebrews. Uh, everybody agrees. Nobody is willing to stand up and say that Apollos wrote this, but we did, and we stand by that. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Oh, this is so good. Oh, mm -hmm. Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, oh, man. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith. Now, see, they thought this was our faith way back when all of this got translated. Because you know what they did? They slipped in the word. Mm -hmm. It's italicized. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith. 
he authored and finished the faith that brought us God's righteousness. Who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Man, and the throne of God is in here, folks. You're, he's not off in some distant place. Eternity is inside. The kingdom of God is inside. The throne of God is inside. God himself is inside. The spirit is inside. Jesus is inside. We are a package deal. And somehow we are all connected to every other human being in that same condition. Why? Because of the faith of God in the blood of Jesus. God had faith. Now, when you hear somebody that tells you that the blood of Jesus was unnecessary, just get up and run. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Or stay and listen long enough till you can see how stupid it really is. Mm-hmm. When God had faith in the blood of Jesus, folks, why should you be discouraged about the blood of Christ? Mm-hmm. If God himself had faith, in the blood of Christ, and it resulted in your own redemption, even if you believe stupid stuff. (laughs) Man, I'm glad Jesus redeemed stupid people. See, Daniel, you're in. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Daniel made it. Oh, my God. We are so grateful. All right. So, uh, you know, I love about this is, you know, you just talked about enduring that Jesus required us yes. to endure. And look at Jesus is fulfilling that. He endured the cross. So wow. that endurance was fulfilled. Yes. In Christ. Yeah. Uh, and, and and Paul went through all of that mm. the, about the tribulation, work of patience and patience. That's what Paul was comparing. Yeah. He was comparing that faith that had to go through tribulation and through all of that stuff. And, and 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 the faith that went through the tribulation and went through all the stuff and the trying and all of that, it was proved. And it was Christ, just like what we read to you. The reason he endured all of that is what Daniel's trying to say here and what Daniel's trying to get me to understand <laughs> is that, uh, that he went through all of that and that was the faith that was approved. Mm-hmm. It's not. Hours that goes through tribulation and tribulation, patience and patience, uh, all of this. And all that's in the book of Romans by comparison Mm. to the righteousness of God. Uh, So uh, before we close this out, and I'm going to ask Daniel if he has any more questions or anything he wants to point out here. Uh, But I do want you to look at the book of James. And uh, I think one of the funniest things in the world about the canonization of the New Testament is the book of James comes after Hebrews. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> how unfair. <laughs> uh, so uh, let's look and see what uh, James had to say. James chapter 2, verse 17 through 24. Now, James spoke about this uh Uh, righteousness uh, that was imputed to Abraham. Different teacher. Paul's acknowledged that it was imputed by his faith, but Paul compared that to God's faith. Now, uh, and you know, these guys had some controversies. They taught at each other, if you will. (laughs) Verse 17, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. That's very true. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. And that's true. Abraham uh, Abraham proved by his works that he believed. Abraham proved it. Uh, Abraham took his son up to that altar and uh, uh, said before he ever went up there, even though God had promised him a son, his only son, 
Now he told him to sacrifice his son, and he said, okay. Yep, and uh, uh, then uh, took his son up, and then God sent the ram in the thicket uh, for the sacrifice then. Uh, So uh, Abraham was ready to kill his own son just because God said so. Uh, that's what ra- that's what radical. You know, the churches that teach on radical faith, they're right, except it's not radical enough. Hmm. There is no radical faith faith church that teaches faith radically as what faith is taught by Jesus. Nor do they stamp sealed. This is faith like Jesus described to anybody who believes, you will do the same works that I did. Mm -hmm. And even greater works than these shall you do because I go to my Father. You're going to be here. So if you are a believer, you're going to do greater works than these. We've taught on this and gone around it in many different ways to look at it, and we still will. He says in verse 19, Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. Now look at this. James says, you believe? Good for you. Because even the devils believe and tremble. Mm. Even the devils believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? You see, he's completely right. But James didn't know about the righteousness that came by the faith of God. He only knew about Father Abraham's faith. He did not understand. He didn't get that three years of personal instruction from the Spirit, from Jesus, however that worked, that Paul got. In fact, he didn't even show up at Jesus' teachings when he was alive. James is never recorded to have been around. He was off on the sides laughing at his brother, telling people, my brother's lost his mind. My brother has lost his freaking mind. And he became the head of the church. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seeing thou how faith wrought with works, and by works was faith made perfect. You see, man's faith can only be perfected by works. I'm so glad to be free. I've been saying it for years, but I didn't know how glad I was to be free from my own faith. Oh, my gosh. Seeing the scripture was fulfilled, which saith Abraham believed God, and it was imputed to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Like uh, Then he goes on and describes other situations but we wanted to show you what uh, what this gentleman, James, if I called him a gentleman in front of Don, he'd probably slap me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think gentleman James would have been uh, uh, the words that uh, uh, Don would have used. Uh, so, folks, uh, this righteousness that you have taught by Paul, that Righteousness that is imputed is by your faith. Righteousness that is made came through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and God's faith in his blood. He did not impute righteousness to you. He gave you his righteousness. You see, The writer of Isaiah knew that what Abraham got was a prequel, if you will. Because the writer of Isaiah, inspired by God, said, there's none righteous. 
No, not one. And Isaiah knew who Abraham was. Whew. I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Daniel, you see anything that we need to cover? Is there any points that we didn't get to? Just one thing that you had me write down, and I will read that for you. Um, and it's... Oh, you're going to blame this on me. Romans chapter 5. <laughs> You've been blaming me on that. <laughs> <laughs> Romans chapter 5, verse 13 says, But sin is not imputed where there is no law. Mm-hmm. Sin is not imputed where there is no law. What is the counterpoint to imputed sin? Mm. Where there is no faith, there is no imputed righteousness. Where will this faith come from? Man or God? One needs maintenance. The other one formed the worlds together. Wow. Did I say that? You said that. <laughs> <laughs> Man. Uh, and it's, uh, I, I stand by that 100%. Uh, folks, you didn't get the prequel nor the, uh, uh, the good marks. Uh, just like I've uh, compared Abraham's righteousness to the Hebrews 11 group. And I was telling Daniel before we got started, I was wrong on that teaching also in Hebrews. Because remember how I used to, how I taught you that, okay, this says that uh, in the beginning, uh, we how we know in Hebrews chapter 11, we know how that the worlds were framed together by the faith of God. And then we start hearing that by faith that uh, all of these characters, Rahab the harlot. I, I don't know why I can only remember eh, Rahab the harlot. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> but anyway, uh, then he begins uh, this whole litany. I mean, it's, it's a long chapter, uh, which ends with that even though they had faith, they got a good report out of it. Mm. And that they, without us, would never have been made perfect. Folks, I tell you, I say this with quite some confidence, that Abraham, without you, would never have been made perfect. Mm. The comparison to imputed sin is imputed righteousness. And thank God we've been delivered. I, I realized after we went through this, uh, after all this started coming up in my mind, and uh, Daniel has been uh, so wonderful in uh, helping me work through these thoughts and giving me his, and uh, it has resulted in this teaching here. As you can see, Daniel's in the secret city. Yay. Um, so uh, uh, he got here because his body is immortal. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't need planes anymore, right? Uh, <laughs> that's what people are probably going to say out of the teaching from the last <laughs> one. Uh, but folks, this completed righteousness, this made righteousness, uh, it is, it's just so powerful. It is, uh, it is the power of God, and uh, we have the message of reconciliation, not the message of imputation. Wow. Good news. Good news. Can I go now, Danny? We're off to a good start. Make sure you come <laughs> back tomorrow morning. Nardos Kaviti. He's got a wonderful word. But before you go, listen to this. Hello again. Daniel asked me to take an offering. I told him I'd be glad to do that, but hey, what all is going on with Mike Williams Ministries, and why should the people be giving their hard-earned cash to you guys? Well, there's a lot going on, that's for sure. Daniel gave me an exciting listing, and here's what's happening. Number one, Facebook has been an excellent platform for Mike Williams Ministries, and Daniel, with his expertise, continues to expand our outreach there. Number two, YouTube is also a fertile platform where more progress is being made on a daily basis. Three, online, other online social media platforms are being initiated. TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, 
Number four, our VP of Outreach, Nardos Kabidi in Vancouver, has recently been hard at work and has established a podcast that is focusing on the, on the folks uh, in Ethiopia and Kenya. And he has already established a large, po- a large following there in this podcast. In that regard, Nardos and Daniel are preparing to go to Africa and Ke- uh, go to Africa, Kenya, and Ethiopia to broaden the outreach and work there. More on that endeavor to be announced in the future. As you know, Mike Williams Ministries in the fall of 2021 put Daniel Rouse on as permanent staff. That in itself has been a massive financial commitment, but Daniel has been absolutely doing a fabulous job and is a massive assistance to Michael himself. Number five, work is ongoing and developing more content types. Shorter videos, blogs, books, study guides. I personally get so much out of the ongoing weekly podcasts and weekly Tuesday night Bible studies. All of these are coordinated, produced, and directed by Daniel. So you can see that your dollars are literally going around the world, touching hearts all over. If you're in Canada, you can call me, Vic, at 403-686-0841, and I'll take your credit card information. That's the easiest way. Or make your checks out to Grace Conferences and mail to the address on your screen. If in the U.S., then make your checks out to Mike Williams Ministries and again, mail to the U.S. address on the screen. If you're in the USA, or go to the Gospel Revolution website and hit the donate link. Remember, though, that Canadians do not get a taxable, tax-deductible receipt if, you're direct, if, you're, if you give directly through the website or to Mike Williams Ministries. For Canadians to get a tax-deductible receipt, you have to give through Grace Conferences. Thank you very much for your support.